Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. And uh, I want to read verses 12 through 18, I believe. Give me thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and who hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn, from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. We gave you an extra verse there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you've allowed us to be in your house today. We thank you, and, and we're glad that, 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 uh, to be here. We're, we're glad that you have promised to meet with us, and we uh, look forward to hearing from you. We just ask that all we do and say be pleasing to you, that you would give us your word, that you would allow me to preach that word, that you would uh, take away anything that would prevent me from preaching that word. Forgive me of my sins and use me at this time. We ask that the lost would be saved. We ask that the, the, uh, the, the cold-hearted would be brought back and stirred and those embers and those fires would, would once again dwell in their hearts. We just ask that you would teach us, reprove us, direct us. All these things we ask in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, that you might receive the honor, the power, and the glory. Amen. I ask you the question, who has preeminence? Who has preeminence? Not only in the church, but in your life. Who, you know, somebody, something has preeminence. And for most of us, if we would admit it, uh, we don't necessarily like it as Christians. We know better, but... Uh, we have the, the preeminence in our lives. We do what, what is best for us most of the time or what is uh, sometimes least painful for us many times. But the Lord obviously needs to have preeminence. I'm not preaching anything that you don't already know. I'm not telling you anything you, you, that you know, but we all needed, need to be reminded of that. Uh, constantly because so many things take preeminence in our lives. They, 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 they take the priority in our lives. They, we sometimes forget to take the time to worship God. And, and we will see that the, the more that the Lord is preeminent in our lives, the better off we are. Uh, that that, uh, the, you know, we just sang that song about how when the prayers go up, the blessings come down. And, and when we put Christ first, we are blessed in ways that are more than monetary, more than material. More than sometimes we can even put our finger on. I'd like to direct your attention at this time to verse 18 of our text. And we'll read that once again. And he is the head of the body, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. First thing I'd like to address is that he is our head. He is our head. Now, primarily, primarily, we are talking, or, or, or Paul is talking about the church. And, the, and by all means, the church should obey the Lord. 
by, by, by all means, the whole reason we exist. And I think we've forgotten that. We've forgotten that in a lot of our churches and, and even scriptural churches, I think, sometimes uh, forget just who and why we're here. I, I recently read a, a, a comment. I don't remember where it was. It's been in the last few weeks, but somebody said, well, you know, they, they weren't going to church. They quit going to church. And, 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 and I'll get into something else here in just a second. I'll chase that rabbit after I chase this one uh, because they weren't getting anything out of it. And the reply was, well, we weren't here for you. We're here to worship the Lord. And if you would get your heart right and get your mind right and get your priorities right, you do get something when you, when you come and worship the Lord. And, and we've tried to stir things up so much. Uh, we were, I think Brenda shared with you that somebody that, that is uh, one of her relatives had posted a video from their church and they were, they had the music playing and they were, batting a beach ball around in their, their church service. And it was, uh, I guess the beach balls were shaped like the world. And, and it was like, uh, oh, it's great to look at the look on their faces as they're worshiping the Lord. They're, they're a bunch of kids and they're batting a beach ball. You know, of course they're going to uh, have some fun. But they said, oh, you know, it was to show them that we need to reach out and, and, and tell the Lord. And that, that does have a place in, in Bible school and places like that. But, you know, the problem is, Christians nowadays, and I use that term loosely, they never grow up. They never grow up. They, they would not have survived in the first century. You read, even in this book, even in this book as I was studying this, uh, um, Colossians, as I was studying this to prepare, is so much of these epistles talk about how to handle suffering. We don't preach on suffering. Well, I, I, I've been doing quite a bit of it lately, but, but for the most part, churches don't preach on suffering. They preach on, you know, how to get God's blessing and how to be a better, and, and all the things that you can get. Christ is to be our head. Christ is to be our focus. And when he is, I think uh, many of those other things, even the suffering, we would endure suffering with joy when we put Christ first. Now, I said this was directed at, at, at churches, but I think uh, churches are made up of what? Brick and mortar? No, they're made up of people. So as individuals, Christ has to be preeminent. Christ has to have first place. He has to be the head of each individual. And the reason why churches are, are made up of uh, of people that really don't care about the preaching of the gospel, they're just there to uh, for the entertainment value, is because that's what their life is. And there's no difference on the inside of the church than the outside of the church. And I know many times I sound like a broken record when I preach on these things, but it's because it's so prevalent. I would love to preach on, on something else. I would rather preach on, on, on a, a thing, you know, rather than constantly dwelling on this. You say, well, we don't have that problem here in this church. I know a lot of churches that have that problem that didn't have that problem 10 years ago. I know a lot of preachers that didn't have, don't, that have that problem now. They didn't have it 10 years ago. So yeah, we dwell on these things. We harp on these things. Because we must never forget who is our head. We must never forget why we, were, we are here. Why we even exist. I started to tell you a, a, a few minutes ago about, we're talking about excuses that people have for not going to church. And, and, and the reason why they don't go to church, they, they don't tell you this, is because Christ is not their head. They have some other excuse. 
Some of you know that, that we went up to my mom's house and uh, around this time, they, they had two times a year in their village, they have uh, yard sales. And our mom's house is right on Main Street and uh, Brenda, you know, for years has many times went up there and had yard sales, garage, a garage sale there because there's a heavy flow of traffic. And uh, trying to get rid of some stuff, you know, and uh, trying to make some money. You know, I think Hannah made the most money out of the, the, the deal. Uh, but uh, in any event, this woman, God bless her, handed Brenda, uh, I, I don't know if it was a track or a, a pamphlet or whatever, invited her to go to church. There's a church up the road. And uh, she said, well, you know, my mother-in-law who lives here, she already goes to this other church. Now, this is a Baptist church, by the way. Um, and uh, she said, you know, we went to that church until my husband was called to pastor. And we, you know, we live in southern Kentucky or something. I wasn't there. I don't know the exact wording. And the woman got disappointed. You know, on the one hand, she should have been excited that, yeah, I met another Christian. But she was disappointed because she was wanting to, you know, uh, get someone to come to their church. The reason why she did that outside of her church is because Christ had a place of importance in her, church, in, in, in her life. And uh, Brother Head and I went out to, to lunch uh, last week sometime. Uh, I can't remember the day, but uh, we went out. We met together, and uh, he had a little pamphlet from his church and uh, some, an article that he had written on it, written in, the, in it. And he, uh, the waitress came up, and he asked her if she went to church. Her excuse was, no, I don't, because when I was growing up, my parents didn't give me a choice. And that was supposed to be a, a viable excuse. Well, obviously, if you, when she got old enough to make the choice, she made the wrong choice. That's why you don't give kids the choice. You teach them. And then they come, they come away one day and they say, you know, they, they hear somebody talking about a foolish man building his house upon the sand. And they say, yeah. I heard the preachers talk about that. There's life lessons in coming. So they say things like, oh, I don't get anything out of it or I didn't have a choice. And they will come up with any reason but the reason is Christ is not their head. They don't know Christ. He is our head as individuals. He is our unifier as the, the head of the church. The church has one distinct beginning in uh, Matthew 16, 18. I didn't write down Matthew. I'm glad I remembered it was Matthew. Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church. This was the beginning of the church. Christ built his church himself. A church is one in doctrine. There's thinking that every Christian every in the world is a part of this big universal church. No, it's one in doctrine according to the scripture. So if you believe a separate set of doctrine, doesn't mean you're not saved. Uh, you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. But we're not in the same church. Number one, you don't, well, you don't have the, the, the same founder because Christ built his church. And your church was founded years, centuries later. Your doctrine is different. The teaching, you know, when, when he gave the Great Commission, it's not just preach the gospel to every creature. It's teaching them also to observe all things that Christ taught us. So we have one distinct beginning, one doctrine. We have one direction. Our direction is that Christ is our head. We are to follow Christ. 
not to follow the trends, not to follow the world, not to follow what some other church is doing. Our direction is not popular. Our direction is not political. Our direction is not necessarily social or economic. Our direction is to follow Christ. Christ came to preach and to teach and to give himself. That is our direction. We're one in devotion. We are to love each other, and that's the hard part, and to love Christ. Because he is our head. He has preeminence because he's our head. He has preeminence because he is the hand that created all things. This is mentioned a few times in that passage that we read. In our verse, it says, who is the beginning? Who is the beginning? He is the beginning of the church, and we already talked about that, but he's the beginning of all things. It says in verse 16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth and, and, and visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. Now a lot of us understand that, but it also says for him. Your purpose is to glorify Christ, is to glorify God. All things glorify God in one way or another. Whether you follow him or not, you're going to glorify God. The Bible starts out with this very simple principle. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. He was there in the beginning. Before anything else, there was God. God created the heavens. The heavens and the earth. God created all things, but, but, but God was there at the beginning. Who created all things? It says here, Christ did. Christ, he is the father from whom all things exist. I was a grown man before I realized that not was not, Jesus was not just the son of the father. He was also the father. Now, I'm a lot older uh, since then, but I, and, and, and I probably can't explain it well, probably don't understand it completely. But Isaiah says that he is the Almighty Father. Christ is the Almighty Father. He is the Father from whom all things exist. The reason why he is the Father of all is because he created all things. <laughs> He's not only the Father whom by, by all things exist, He is the Son who is the spitting image of the Father. Verse 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? John said that we beheld His glory as the only begotten Son of God. He is the spitting image of God. Was it Thomas that asked Jesus, show us the Father? He said, how long have you been with me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And to a certain extent, to a certain extent, if someone sees you, they should see Jesus. The more like Jesus we are, the more they're going to see Jesus in us. He is the spirit that dwells upon the earth and inside every believer. Jesus is physically gone, but his spirit still remains. 
We look around, we think the world is, is out of control at this, at this time. His spirit is still here. And he's still controlling me. In our passage, it talks about how kingdoms and principalities and thrones are all created by him. It's hard for us to understand how someone like Putin can be in power. But that's the will of the Spirit. That's the will of God. He's allowed it. He's got a purpose for that. Some of our political leaders, it's like, how in the world is God allowing them to do it? He's got a, he's got a plan. Now, our job as Christians is to vote for those that we feel best represent Christ. Seems like the decision gets harder every election, doesn't it? He created all things according to verses 16 and 17. Everything you see, everything you don't see, the visible, the invisible, the physical, the metaphysical, it all was created by the hand that created all things, Jesus Christ. How can we fail to give him preeminence? It took the multitudes until the book of Revelation before they, 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 they shouted and fell down before him. He is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. Why don't we live that way today? He's just as worthy today as he will be in eternity. He is our hope. Scripture said he's the firstborn of the dead there in our passage in verse 18 what does that mean it means that he died and rose again and now we have hope of a resurrection we have hope of eternal life Titus said that, that they were they worshiped the Christ why in the hope of eternal life which God promised before the world began. We have hope. Why? Because, number one, he's our redeemer. There is no redemption outside of Christ. Verse 5 in this same great chapter says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven... Where have you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel? There is no hope outside of the gospel. There's perhaps false hope. What was it in the 1950s when they, when they formed the United Nations? That was going to be the hope that they would bring peace to the world. How's that working out? Y'all ever hear of a show called Star Trek? Star Trek is in the 1960s. And the idea that the creator of Star Trek had was that we're going to create a future where mankind has band together and they've solved all the problems. And then that now they're able to do all these things and explore out to the universe because they've solved all the problems here on Earth. And even in that show... There's conflict, and there's fighting, and there's violence. There's backbiting. What kind of hope is that? You say, well, that's just fiction. That's just fiction. The hope of anyone outside of Christ that things are going to get better, that this world is going to change. It's just fiction. That's all it is. According to verse 14, he's our redeemer. 
in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Once again, He is our hope, and, and, and only by Him we can be redeemed. Why? Well, we said, Revelation said that He is worthy. Peter said in his first epistle, it was by His precious blood that He was... Uh, uh, as was pictured in the Old Testament as, as that lamb without spot, without blemish, because he was perfect, because he was worthy, because he was able to offer up his blood, we have redemption and we have forgiveness of our sins. Nowhere in the scriptures and nowhere in reality can you be saved and be forgiven of your sins outside of the blood of Christ. He is our reconciler. Verses 20 through 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in heaven, or I'm sorry, in earth, or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked works, yet hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable, unreprovable rather, in his sight. We are reconciled to God by the blood, by the death, by the giving of the flesh of Jesus Christ. We already said we were forgiven of our sins. Our, our, our sins had set us apart from, from God. But the, the sin of man drove him out of the presence of God, drove him out of the Garden of Eden. But Christ, the second Adam, came, lived that perfect sinless life, and offered up himself that we would be reconciled to God and reconciled to each other. Once again, you look at the world and there, there, there's fighting among the races. Um, you all heard of the tragedy that happened in Buffalo, New York yesterday. A white supremacist went into a, a shopping mall and, and, or a shopping store, a grocery store, and killed 10 people. In New York, a, a weeks earlier, a black man who hated white people went into the subway and started shooting people. And it's not just racial hatred. There, there, there's hatred uh, all throughout the world. Yet in Christ, yet in Christ, we are all reconciled. There is no black. There is no white. There is no Asian. There is no, there, there, there is no color. We are one. We are reconciled to God and then we are reconciled according to this to each other. There's even no male or female. We are all the sons of God. If you can reconcile male and female, that's doing something, isn't it? He's our renewer. We have hope. For every day, Jeremiah wrote in the book of Lamentation, by morning, by morning, new mercies I see. Why? Because great is the faithfulness of God. He renews our hope every day. The reason why we don't give up is because God has given us hope for every day. You have a bad day? We feel like tomorrow is going to be better, don't we? Why is that? It's that hope that dwells inside of us. He is our returning champion. Verse 27. 
to whom God would make known, that is, the riches of glory in the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have hope for glory, don't we? We're not talking about the glory, the, the, the fading glory of the world. Um, what was it, 1976? Uh, Bruce Jenner was the great, world's greatest athlete. Was on the box. He did a Wheaties commercial. He won the decathlon. By the time the century changed over, he was on this TV show and he was more or less became a joke. As the women on that show just made a, a, a mockery of him. We won't even go to where he's at now. Nobody thinks of him waving the American flag in 1976 when they hear his name now, do they? You know, athletes are raised up, they're praised, and then they're forgotten. Anybody ever hear that song by Johnny Cash about a man named Ira Hayes? The story of Ira Hayes was he was one of, he was an American, uh, uh, he was a Native American, he was one of the Marines on Iwo Jima, and he was one of those men that raised that flag there that is the famous Marine statue. And the song is about how he had fallen, and he was nothing now but a drunk, and the only glory he had was every year they let him come out and present the flag at their, uh, their parade they had. The glory of the world is fleeting. But we have a hope of greater glory. We have a hope of eternal glory. That God will raise us up. That Jesus at the rapture will call us. And whether we be dead and alive, we will meet with him in the air. Christ in us gives us that hope of glory. Titus 2.13 says, We are looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Should he not have preeminence? There's no hope in, in, in riches. There's no hope in the world. There's no hope in the future without Christ. And he is our heart. He is our heart. The scripture says that he might have preeminence. In other words, he is our first love. He is our foremost love. We need to put Christ first. It's funny, last week I was preaching on Mother's Day and I made this, this statement that uh, telling the, the, the young people was if, if you... Uh, find a spouse that puts Christ first, that loves Christ first, that loves God first, that you'll never be shortchanged. So I don't I think it was I think it was the next day, maybe. I was listening to Brother Holt preach his Mother Day, Mother's Day sermon. And he said, you know, if you have a mother that loves Christ more than you. You're going to have a good mother. Basically, he said the same thing about the, the paternal relationship or the maternal relationship and paternal as well. That I said about spouses. Basically, they'll love you more. They'll treat you better. They'll be more faithful. Because they put Christ first. If Christ has preeminence, all those other things fall into place. You read about, you know, in the news the last few weeks, there's been a famous lawsuit over a couple that got divorced. Famous actors, and one's also a musician. You read about all these, these, these people that seem to have everything that the world wants, but their, their lives are falling apart.
because they don't put Christ first. That he might have preeminence. Put Christ first. And if he has preeminence, all the other things in your life will be okay. Verse 28 says, we must give a warning. It says, whom we preach, once again talking about Christ in us, the hope of glory. Why do we preach him? Because he's in us. You speak what's inside of you. You speak what's in your heart. The reason why we don't preach more, we don't speak more of Christ, we don't share more of Christ, we don't talk more of Christ, we don't witness for Christ, we don't exemplify Christ, is because he is not in us to the point where he should be in us. He doesn't have the preeminence in our lives. He says, but when he's in us, we have a hope of glory, we preach warning every man. We should be concerned that souls are going to hell. Warning every man. We should be concerned that lives are falling apart. We are to warn every man. We are, are, should be concerned that children are growing up in homes without Christ. Warning man, every man. We should be concerned that Satan has his hold on this country. We need to warn every man. We need to warn every man that there is a God who judges and there is a hell that burns. And there is a hope that is in Christ. We must warn every man. We must teach wisdom, it says. Teaching every man in all wisdom. Teach every man in all wisdom. Now, the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of God. Anybody ever hear that? I didn't make that up. That's written down. More than one place in the Bible. But that's the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. The understanding you know, so much preaching is just foolishness anymore. They've taken the foolishness of preaching and just turned it into foolish preaching. We are to teach in wisdom. We are to teach in love. We are to teach them scripturally. Not based on our emotions. Not based on our, our opinions. Not based on our affiliations. But teach in wisdom. And then it says we must work mightily. Whereunto I also labor, verse 29, striving according to his working, which worketh mightily, worketh in me mightily. The Bible says we're not to be weary in well-doing. One way to not be weary in well-doing is, is to have Christ working mightily in you. And how can he work mightily in you? By giving me him the preeminence in your life. When you, when, when you set aside all those other things, when you set aside uh, uh, things that the world may want you to desire and the flesh may want you to desire, you'll work mightily. You'll be willing to give a, wisdom, a warning. You'll be willing to teach wisdom. You'll work mightily. You're willing to get up early. You're willing to stay up late. Many will do that to succeed in business. Many will do that to, to succeed in getting the things in this world. The things that the moths eat. The things that rust destroys. The things that thieves will steal. And even time will steal those things from you eventually. Oh, why don't you give Christ the preeminence and lay your treasures up in heaven? That is wisdom. That is the warning I give. And that is the message that will work mightily. Would you stand?